just want to make sure I'm in the right group. I think we're all good to go. How is everybody? I think we're on Tuesday today. I tend to have a, a few issues with getting the days right, but I think we're on Tuesday. And today we are talking about how to use essential oils with your pets. Now, when I think of pets, we all have myriad animals within our four walls and sometimes out the back. So we're just going to focus today mainly on, on cats and dogs because they're the most common pets. But we can apply these to rabbits, guinea pigs, birds, etc. Hey, Colleen, um, horses, cattle, etc. But I'm not going to go into that too much today because Steve is a domestic vet who mostly works with um, domestic animals. So that's kind of where we're going to stay. Um, I'm going to try and keep it to around 30, 35 minutes. And then if you guys have got any questions, um, jump on in. So when you come into this class, if you can just do a little hands up and say hi, just because I need to know who's in here for Diamond Club numbers. This is a Diamond Club class. If that doesn't make any sense to you, just ignore it. Uh, it just means that when you purchase, you get extra freebies this month. So you're going to get an extra citrus bliss and an extra tangerine. But I can go through that at the end. Now, what I want to do is, other than saying hello to everyone, introduce this big guy over here and the little guy. We've actually got two guys here. We've got Dr. Stephen and we have Joas the Galar. Hello, everyone. Joe's been quiet. He just wants cuddles. Just wants cuddles. That's our little baby Joe, one of two Galars that we, that we have in our household that runs rampant. We have a girl and a boy. This is our little boy. Oh, hello. hello. <laughs> Say hi, Joey. So Joey was a rescue as well. We have two rescue galahs and uh, they're full of a lot of love, actually. It's really beautiful. So, um, okay, so we're going to go through a few really, really common, common complaints today that we have with our animals, mostly with our dogs and cats. Steve's going to give a a really nice overview of what goes on underneath these complaints and what we perhaps might generally use at the vet clinic um, and I'm going to come in and have a chat about some natural solutions using essential oils that help support those processes those journeys to um, you know bringing your pet back to ultimate wellness so we're going to kind of riff between us now I'm just going to give you a quick overview Steve has been a vet for how long uh, 35 years 35 years Long time, um, mostly in Sydney and now the Northern Rivers. Is that right? Yep. Sydney and the Northern Rivers. Um, Steve spent, you know, quite a considerable amount of time building up vet practices in Sydney. So he had three big vet practices in Sydney and also was the, um, the vet on the Today Show for 15 years. So has had a lot of experience with media as well and making animal documentaries and getting out there in the world of conservation, which is fantastic. So has a real love of, you know, uh, everything to do with animals, pets, wildlife conservation, the whole enchilada actually. And up here is in the process of building a wildlife hospital in Byron Bay which they're going through the process at the moment, which is really, really exciting because I think our nearest wildlife hospital is Corumban and we have a huge area up here in the Northern Rivers where a lot of the wildlife just directs into the, you know, the nearest vet clinic and we don't necessarily have the time or the expertise to deal with them. So Steve's putting together a huge project at the moment for Byron Bay to build this wildlife hospital, which is just incredible. Um, and uh, we're all really excited. I think most of you know how I know Steve. We, we have a child together. <laughs> most of you know that. Steve gets a mention in just about every single Facebook Live or he walks past. Um, so, yeah, we co-parent up here in the Northern Rivers and, um, and we have a lot of fun together with our daughter, Pearl, who is seven. And you guys also see her come and go in these Facebook Lives as well. So we have between us, how many pets between us, Steve? I think uh, about 14 or 15. Yeah, we have a lot of animals between us that live between two houses. So this is just one right here. He's having some time with his dad. Hey? Mm, beautiful He's boy. not squawking at the moment, which is good. He just wants some love. <laughs> so um, welcome, everybody. You guys know who I am. I get I introduce myself every time I do a Facebook Live. You know who I am. I'm Angel, integrative health coach lover of essential oils. I've used them for four years now, this particular brand, doTERRA. 
studying Chinese medicine, total lover of energy medicine and vibrational frequency, everything to do with uh, natural healing and, uh, you know, how we can kind of empty out our, our chemical laden, toxin laden homes and use something that's a little bit uh, more healthy, you know, for longevity in a nutshell. So I'm going to jump in and hello, hello, my loves. Thank you for joining. I'm going to jump in and what we're going to do today is we're just going to keep it really, really simple. We're going to have a chat about a couple of the most common ailments and complaints that Steve comes across in the vet clinic. Uh, so he's down at Lennox Head a couple of days a week and floating around different other practices up here. So you might actually see him in the flesh if you if you live up here. Just go to Lennox Head and ask for Steve. This guy here, you might get this little one as well. Um, and so we're going to chat about some of the most common complaints that we all come across. Um, I have a 16 year old cat, I have a nine year old dog, so I've come across these as well. And traditionally, hey, Mary Ann, uh, traditionally we, me personally, and I like to come into these classes with personal experience rather than just rattling stuff off like an encyclopedia. It's not really how I like working. So when I think of my two key animals that we that I had personally before we added everyone else in with the baby, uh, I think about the, the main things that have been issues for them, which is probably skin, uh, stress and anxiety, um, muscle pain, uh, broken bone. Uh, definitely gastrointestinal disorders. We've had that a lot with Bubba, our 16 year old cat at the moment. And I want to really, really uh, make it very, very clear from the beginning that whilst I love essential oils and I love natural solutions, it is actually really important to um, have a good local vet that you uh, trust uh, and that you don't muck around with, with serious conditions with your animals. So we still use modern medicine on our pets. I have a fridge full of modern medicine, which I'm definitely not going to come on here and say we just use essential oils because we don't. This class is about, you know, kind of conveying the message that we can use these essential oils as a beautiful support system just the way we do for us as humans. Um, and we can do the same with pets, but we're just going to dilute it down and we're just going to have a little bit more education around what oils we can and can't use for them. Okay. So, I don't want anyone to think, yep, we're switching to essential oils for animals because it's really, really important when things go a bit pear-shaped with our pets, which can happen very quickly, like snake bites and ticks and, you know, inflammatory bowel and um, abscesses, etc., which we'll have a chat about, that you actually, you know, go and see the vet. Really important. Steve and I have talked, oops, I've got a bird caught up in my hair. <laughs> and Steve and I, have, we've had so many conversations around this particular issue where people think that, you know, if they, you know, rub a bit of lavender in or a bit of copaiba or whatever, the pet will be fine. And we know that the pet's not fine. It needs it needs additional support from a medical professional. And just the same with humans, guys. Like, I would never come in here and say, look, just throw your oils on and don't see the doctor. Um, I have an integrative doctor up here, but I hardly ever go, only for, you know, really, really urgent stuff, which hardly ever happens. So just keep that in mind. And, and come and... You know, any questions that you've got around, you know, the medical side, the vet side, Steve's here to answer them. And, and I'll go through some of my favourite oils that we've used on Bubba and Olive and, and some other additional information that I've got from Dr. Roark in America. So she's an essential oil vet that is actually on the board of doTERRA now, I think. She's amazing. So I'm a part of her private member group where I get lots of information on the best oils and the best application for them. So it's about bringing together both sides of medicine, which we do as humans anyway. It's really important. Hey, Jojo. Have I missed anyone in here? Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. All right. So I'm going to jump in and we're going to talk about a couple of things. The first being skin conditions. Now, skin conditions is really common in humans and it's also really common in pets. So I'm going to defer to mm -hmm. Dr. Stevie just to have a chat about what happens when pets present with skin conditions and what he would traditionally use and and how we can potentially get in uh, and use preventative measures, which I'll talk about with a couple of these sprays and topical applications yeah. in regards to keeping our pets healthy in regards to skin, skin inflammation. Mm, well, okay. Skin is probably the most common thing, uh, issue we see with pets in veterinary clinics. Um, and some breeds are, are way more up, uh, overrepresented there. So, Staffies, for instance, uh, frequently have skin issues. German Shepherds and Golden Retrievers can get hot spots and things like that. And fundamentally, the 
there's four main causes of skin allergies in dogs. Uh, atopy is the most common one, and that's inhaled allergens. So, you know, pollens and house dust mite and things like that. When humans inhale those allergens, we tend to get hay fever or even asthma and things, things like that. With dogs, it generally manifests in the skin. Um, and there's a certain distribution pattern that we see that, that is typical of, of atopy. Um, and there's a certain you know, sort of treatment regime I'll go through shortly. The second one that we frequently see is a contact allergy dermatitis. So um, that's uh, certain plant types, grasses that can even be floor coverings and rugs and things like that. Uh, it tends to affect the hairless regions on the dogs, uh, tummy uh, under the armpits and in the groin area. Um, and you know that's, that can be quite a debilitating condition too. Um, we also see a lot of food allergies, surprisingly. So uh, you know, dogs, there's, there's any number of diets out there and people get a bit confused. And um, there's, a, there's a couple of proteins, uh, beef and chicken in particular, that a lot of dogs simply can't tolerate, and cats. And um, you know, we, see, we see a certain distribution in skin disease uh, through, through dietary intolerance. And then we see less these days, but in certain areas and certain times of year, you'll see quite a lot of flea allergy dermatitis. That's typically at the tail of the base, uh, sorry, the base of the tail. And, um, you know, it's not to say that dogs can't get fleas, but some dogs are allergic to flea bites, like humans are allergic to, to a bee sting. So, and those dogs will break out in, in terrible skin disease. So, you know, traditionally, years and years ago, any of those sort of allergies, we've probably reached for cortisone. Um, there's far more sophisticated medications now that we can use. Um, there's a, there's a, a series of tablets called Apoquel, and the same uh, company that makes that has a, an injectable form called Cytopoint. Apoquel and Cytopoint are both very, very skin specific, whereas cortisone is a very generalized drug. It's used as an immunosuppressant agent, an anti inflammatory agent, lots of other things. So, And it can have lots of, obviously side effects short term and long term. So. You know, we try to avoid cortisone wherever possible these days. Uh, not to say it's a bad drug, it's a great drug, but, you know, overuse of it uh, is, is not necessarily a good thing, and particularly when there are better uh, skin-specific products. But it also comes down to control. So if it's a contact allergy dermatitis, try and avoid the, the plant types or the coverings or whatever it might be that, that are setting that off. If it's a food allergy dermatitis, we'd be looking to get the uh, animal on a, on a, uh, a low allergen diet, uh, you know, maybe a natural diet or, or raw food diet, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, if it's a flea allergy dermatitis, you um, you know you've got to get the fleas off them. So if they don't have fleas, they can't get flea allergy dermatitis. And then you know the hard one is is atopy because you know seasons change. There's always different pollens and things in the air, and some dogs are just highly highly sensitive to it. So that's a harder one to control. Um, you can get skin desensitization injections created specifically for your pet. But it's a long and arduous process, and it doesn't mean that they might not develop allergens, allergies to other allergens. So, um, you know, some people do go that path, but it can be it can be a long and frustrating exercise. So, there are lots of things we can do in in the veterinary world, obviously, to address these. But um, you know, as Angel and I were discussing earlier, uh, trying to arrest these problems in the early stage is always better than treating when the pets, you know, really severely compromised and the skin's really inflamed and they're just scratching incessantly and not sleeping and keeping everyone awake and becoming, you know, a grumpy pet. So, you know, uh, early, early intervention is best. So, Angel, you've got a few thoughts on that? Oh, I've just got a bird tangled in my hair. <laughs> okay, it's okay. <laughs> oh my God. Come on, Jojo. Okay, I got the bird out. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much for explaining that. I think it's really important that we understand this stuff from a scientific point of view of what's really going on here and really get to the bottom of how we can prevent it. From a essential oils point of view and natural medicine point of view, there's two, two supportive aids that I like for skin conditions that we've used here with these guys. One being a spray. Um, this is just an itch spray. So it's literally just uh, distilled water, some colloidal silver, some aloe vera, and then this particular little guy's got lavender, roman, chamomile, geranium, and myrrh. You know, I was just saying to Steve before, the reason we've got lavender and, and roman chamomile in there is because they're very calming. So you can imagine with skin conditions, it can kind of wind you up and make you anxious. But at the same time, lavender is also really good for the skin. It's one of the best essential oils for skin inflammation, as is roman chamomile, as is geranium, as is myrrh. Uh, you know, I can think of so many times where I've used these oils for myself on my skin. Recently, I think there's a video on where I was talking about two spider bites that I had on my body where I dug the myrrh out for those spider bites and the and the healing was next level it was incredible it just I don't think I'd actually really investigated you know fully 
how incredible myrrh is as an essential oil. And it's quite viscous like um, vetiver. So you can use it. I use it directly without carrier oil, but we always say you should use carrier oil. That's what the, that's what the science team at doTERRA say. But these little uh, itch sprays are amazing. Um, as I just mentioned, um, you only need, what's the drops? 20 drops of lavender, 10 drops of cedar wood, five drops of vetiver, five drops of frankincense. And you can kind of mix it up a little bit. We've got lots of oils to play with here. Helichrysum is also incredible for skin, obviously for us and also for our pets. But just make sure you've got the, the dilution right because you've got to be really careful with dogs and cats. Um, and we all, we've all we all heard the stories around this, but we've got to really be really careful with how we use these oils around them to ensure that it's safe. And, and additionally for us as well, every time I talk in here, I'm always letting you guys know that we have to um, respect the power of the plant because they're volatile aromatic compounds and we don't want to be throwing this stuff around willy-nilly. Um, you know, as a general rule, they're pretty safe. You know, I use frankincense every single day for myself and my pets. It's pretty safe. But if you're going to go into, you know, the tea trees, the oreganos, the thymes, the hot oils like clove and cinnamon, you've got to be so, so careful with your pets diffusing topically. And if you're using them internally, I'll say, I was going to talk about this later, but, you know, putting a drop in their water, but you're not going to do that for cats. That's just for dogs. Um, so the spray bottle is a really, really easy way to help relieve uh, skin symptoms and the, and the anxiety that's related to the skin symptom. If you're not using a spray, you're going to use it topically. So again, we're going to use our carrier oil, our fractionated coconut oil, which is really beautiful and smooth and silky and it doesn't smell like coconut, it's not, it doesn't go rancid, it doesn't stain. And you can add a couple of drops of the, the lavender, the cedar wood, the, vet, the vetiver and use it topically. Um, on the skin condition. I've done this many times with olive. Um, most of the time I use frankincense or copaiba on olive. Um, so that's my dog, my chihuahua Jack Russell. And she's had a few skin complaints where the skin's gone red and crusty and a bit funny. I obviously always defer to Steve. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here, especially around the anal gland area. Um, she's got a bite on her back at the moment, which could turn a bit nasty. So we're using, um, I'm using a topical application of it, it's just frankincense and lavender at the moment so those two um those two remedies so the, the the spray and the topical application are really really good as a support system to what's actually really going on and as steve just said it's really important to get the food right uh to look at the environment they might be there might be an allergy to the grass or you know they have, they have allergies to the weirdest things i've seen things online where dogs have died because there's been a certain plant in the backyard that has flared up their skin and then the dog has passed or the cat has passed and people don't realize you know what what's toxic and what's not but so there's so many different reasons why this can happen or um you know the list goes on and on so i just want to keep it really simple spray topical application when we're, we're doing when we're doing a topic topical application i use just a little bowl or often just use my hand and i'll just use my carrier oil and a couple of drops rub it into my hand rub it into the dog the spine of the dog's a really good place um, into the paws as well is a really great place but other than that actually onto where the skin is flaring up um, is ideal but if you're not sure please always reach out and always research we, there's quite a few um, essential oils vets out there that just do essential oil work you know in terms of um, you know um, finding solutions for animals I mean obviously it's not the only one they're obviously using um, pharma, pharma treatment as well but there are a couple online Steve's not a full-time expert he might be in the future who knows um, so make sure you always explore and research this stuff really really carefully don't be silly with this stuff and start throwing essential oils on your pets without researching it's really really important so my advice would be if your pet gets an itch if it's in early stages um, you know put this on use, use your essential oil spray that Angel described. Um, but one of the critical things to preventing uh, itches getting a lot worse is is to stop the animal chewing at it or scratching at it or biting at it. Um, and if there's, you know, if they're doing that, then you, you might want to just have a, an Elizabethan collar on standby, you know, those sort of cones of shame that come out there. Um, it just stops them ripping at it because there's a thing called the scratch itch cycle. And, you know, if you get an itchiness and you keep scratching at it, it just, it actually makes it worse. So for the, to give something like this a chance, there's a camera there, to give something like that a chance, uh, just try and stop the pet from ripping at that spot uh, or that area. So 
head collar on, put the spray on, give it a couple of days. If it's simply not responding, you're going to have to go and you know seek veterinary advice and, and that pet may meet, need further medication. But we often prescribe topicals. Usually they have cortisone in it. So, you know, this essential oil product could absolutely substitute that and, and, and may get you the result you want without, without having to go to further medications and, and veterinary, veterinary advice. So try that first. Awesome. I just realised that I was, this actually has uh, lavender, Roman chamomile, geranium and myrrh, which is for skin. And when I was reading before, I was reading off the anxiety mix, which I'm going to talk about now because I'm confused because I have a bird on me. Okay, so just jumping back to the skin conditions. So this could be scrapes, excessive licking, itching, all of the above. Okay, any questions, just drop them in and we'll have a chat at the end. Secondly, anxiety. One of my favorite topics, I love talking about this in here in regards to us as humans when we're just breaking down. Steve, what are your thoughts on anxiety and how it comes about in our dogs and cats? Well, it's probably the second most um, common condition that we're presented with as veterinary surgeons in practice. Um, you know, anxiety, behavioural issues are, are a huge area. Um, again, a lot of breeds are overrepresented there. Staffies, once again, uh, they're pretty highly strung dogs. Um, dogs like poodles uh, are very, very uh, owner sort of dedicated. Um, they suffer a lot of separation anxiety if they're away from their owners. You know, chihuahuas, lots of dogs. I mean, it's not it's not exclusively breeds. Some are just more more common, but. Um, you know, any dog can, can suffer anxiety. It can be for any number of reasons. So it could be, you know, moving a house or uh, a new pet arrives or a baby arrives or, you know, there's a breakup in a relationship or, uh, you know, a companion pet in the house dies. Um, any sorts of change in environment or, you know, a bully dog moves in next door or, you know, a bully cat or anything. So, and these things frequently get worse with time, unfortunately. So, you know, when we start to see behavioural issues in younger dogs, I always warn owners that they are far more likely to get worse than they are to, to stay stable or, or get better. They just simply don't seem to do that. Uh, one of the big ones we see is, is noise phobia, um, you know, thunderstorm. About 10% of dogs have this, believe it or not. Uh, thunderstorm phobia, fireworks, cars backfiring, lawn mowers can be all sorts of things. And, and again, they, 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 they sort of anxiety gets heightened with time. Um, as I mentioned, separation anxiety earlier. Uh, you know, we can see obsessive compulsive behavior where dogs will just lick ex excessively, obsessively at a spot, uh, tail chase, um, or in inappropriate urination indoors. There's a lot of, and cats would particularly do that. Uh, if cats don't like things, they're, they're, they're very sensitive barometer and they often behave very inappropriately. So they might just start urinating around the house or peeing around the house very deliberately, um, you know, just to, just to piss you off and uh, and to make a statement, so which my cat has done recently. Yep. So uh, <laughs> it's so, so annoying. So you know, the, the, it, it's a it's a very common area, and, and it's a source of enormous frustration for owners. Um, you know, they, they're often upsetting neighbours if the dogs are barking excessively. They're often upsetting the household. People aren't sleeping. You know, they they just stop enjoying the pet, and, and clearly the pet's highly strung out. So again, you know, where there's a number of measures we would take, there's um, we'd start probably with uh, synthetic pheromones. So dogs and cats release pheromones. We can't smell them. They detect them with, with special glands um, and they create pleasing pheromones. They also create other, other pheromones that exhibit fear and things like that. But the pleasing pheromones are what the synthetic analogs are made of. Uh, the dog one is called Adaptal. Uh, it could come as a collar, uh, a spray or a diffuser. The cat one is called Fellaway, which is a spray uh, or a diffuser. Um, and that's the starting point, particularly in a multi-pet household, um, where rather than trying to t treat the individual and missing the others, you, you just treat the whole whole environment. So that's a, that's a good starting point. Obviously, with noise phobias, we sometimes use drugs like Valium uh, or the dog equivalent of Xanax, um, and um, you know they they're just a uh, on a sporadic basis. So dogs can detect the thunderstorm coming hours and hours before we know about it. And we're not sure whether they're detecting changes in barometric pressure or whether it's noises they're hearing from a long, long, long way away um, or another sense we don't know, but uh, they do detect it. So we can, we can control those individual um, moments with that. And, and sometimes that's enough, but ultimately sometimes we have to put pets on, on their equivalent of Prozac. And um, you know, frequently that's, that's long term and, uh, Short of changing environment and trying all those sorts of things, uh, frequently that's where we end up. And I've treated thousands and thousands of pets over, over many years with, with equivalent sort of medications with generally good success. 
But, you know, I think uh, the, there's a number of uh, essential oils that Angel's already talked about and we'll talk about more now that can definitely, you know, sort of exhibit calmness in, in pets and help that sort of general situation, much like the pheromones. That's awesome. Thanks for that. It's really, really, it's, I think it's really important to understand all of that. Um, uh, and as, as Steve just said, these little sprays, these little top, topical applications are just there on a day-to-day -day preventative basis just to help slow everything down, particularly with anxiety. It's the same with humans, guys. You know what I'm in here talking about? Uh, my favourite um, blends and a set, like single essential oils just to calm the nerves, calm the system. It's the same with our pets. And I think that, you know, because I have so many diffusers going, my animals get it all through osmosis. But, um, you know, if I need something extra, I'm going to use a little anxiety spray. Uh, this spray is the same as the, uh, the itch spray. It's distilled water with some lavender, cedarwood, vetiver and frankincense. Now we know that all of those oils are really, really good for calming the nervous system, uh, particularly lavender. It's been known for eons of time how good lavender is for promoting calm, and nervous tension. Um, vetiver, it's a sedative. So having a couple of drops of vetiver in there, I think this one is uh, five drops. So really good for calming the farm for all of those reasons Steve was just talking about. And if we're using them topically, again, we're just going to use our fractionated coconut oil. And you guys can just make a little touch roller for your pet. So this is a 10 mil bottle. You're just going to pop, say, you know, half the bottle of um, carrier oil and the rest of it with these same drops. So lavender, cedarwood, vetiver and frankincense. And this is just a little topical roller. Maybe put some aloe vera in there as well, a little bit of vitamin E. It's a little topical roller just to help them, you know, stay centred and in that in that calm place. Uh, there's so many reasons, as Steve just said, why our pets get overwhelmed. Um, especially if the humans are overwhelmed, the pets feel it. We've definitely had times in this house, haven't we, where there's been a whole lot of overwhelm for whatever reason and the pets all start to kind of razz out. So it's really important that we're treating the whole house. I think it's really important. So, yeah, just like the skin spray topically, um, I probably wouldn't be using them internally at this, at this rate. You could, the, the things we're about to talk to, uh, talk about like digestion and food intolerances, we can possibly pop in water, a couple of drops in water, but for anxiety, I'd just be using a spray and topical application. The two more things on that, and, and I just touched on one of them, is, yeah, if there's general anxiety in the house that people are strung out, and, you know, these are challenging times with, with people stuck in homes and job losses and mm. financial hardship. Um, your pets do pick that up on that, very, very much so. They pick up on good vibes and they pick up on, on negative vibes too. So, you know, look after yourselves as much as you need to look after your pets. The other thing, and I, met, I touched on this earlier, these things, anxiety issues, behavioural issues in dogs, particularly cats, tend to get worse with time. Uh, Adaptal very recently produced a little collar for puppies. So they're recognising the fact that if you apply early intervention with behavioural issues, you've got a better chance of, of correcting it and nipping it in the bud. So if you have a, a pup or a young dog or you know, a juvenile that's starting to exhibit some behavioural issues, I crack onto it straight away with either the oils and or products like Adaptal or fell away for the cats um, because you've got a chance of actually fixing and correcting it rather than having to manage it when it becomes a chronic uh, intractable issue later. So early early intervention, early involvement is, is best. Mm. And easy ways to apply it, guys. You can apply to, I did uh, frankincense on Olive's ears last night, just on the tips of the ears and on the outside of the ears, not a lot, just topically, just to help her stay calm. Um, you can also use lavender peace and balance for OCD, like chronic OCD as well, which, which we use the same way in humans. Um, or pop a little bit on their favourite toy, just a drop on their favourite toy or their blankie. Um, they're all really easy ways to apply, or maybe between the pads, the, the paw pads. So a little bit of topical, a little bit of um, carrier oil, a little bit of lavender, a little bit of balance, a little bit of cedar wood, and, and whoops, we have a bird, <laughs> a bird caught in my head. Again, just keep it really, really simple, guys. Thank you. Okay, so moving on from anxiety and overwhelm, we're going to have a chat about dietary intolerances. So this could be reflux, indigestion, constipation, diarrhea, hairballs, all of the above. I'm uh, going to rescue the birds from the pouring rain, and Steve's going to have a quick chat before I jump back in. Well, we touched on, on some of this stuff in the, the skin conditions with uh, dietary intolerance. But yeah, there's... Um, it's a very, very common issue with pets that have ongoing diarrhea, that develop inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, um, 
hair, hair ingesting cats in particularly can trigger all these sorts of things with, with vomit and regurgitation. Um, so diet is, is, is absolutely critical in us and, and our pets. Uh, it's very confusing out there as a pet owner. There are a vast array of foods. You know, vets obviously stock a, a range of prescription diets and science diets. Um, the pet shops all have stuff and there's all the online things. You know, there, there's a vast array. Some are, are better researched and better quality products than others. That's, that's no, there's no doubt. I would always suggest um, and always advise to feed better quality foods. The cheap, cheap brands are cheap for a reason. Uh, and we do see a lot of issues with, with a lot of those sorts of brands. So try and avoid cheap stuff, but it doesn't mean that if you're paying more, it's necessarily better and, or, nor right for your pet. Um, and every every pet is different. Every digestive tract is different. So it is, it is a big area. It's a, it's a common, common problem. Um, and, you know, I think if you're starting to see uh, dietary issues or gastrointestinal issues with your pet, whether it's vomiting, regurgitation, um, whether it's diarrhea, whether it's constipation, um, you know, seek advice early. Um, a dietary change would be the first advice we would give as veterinarians. And if that doesn't resolve it, then, you know, there, there's potentially medications. And cats that groom a lot, long hair cats in particular, hairball ingestion is a major, major problem. Uh, I've found over the years the only way to really remedy that is to use a laxative gel. It doesn't give them diarrhea. It's, just, it's, it's like a molasses sort of paste. It's quite flavoursome, so they don't mind it. It binds up the, the fur that would otherwise sit in the stomach and moves it through the gastrointestinal tract. If it stays in the stomach, it rubs the stomach lining and causes a permanent irritation and inflammation, and that's what causes the vomit and regurgitation. So that hair, because it's indigestible, just sits there. So getting it through the tract is ideal. Um, otherwise, they're just going to attempt to vomit all the time, all the time, whether they've got hair sitting there or not. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you know, with, with certain diets, we, we do see a lot of inflammatory bowel disease in pets, a lot. Um, we, uh, we have one animal in this house yeah. who's struggled for quite some time. I had a, um, uh, I had a, a Boston Terrier for 15 years. He, he lived a life with, with IBD, which was managed purely with diet. Uh, he very rarely ever needed medication. It's just dietary managed. So, you know, be mindful of that. It does exist. Uh, don't persist with the same thing if it isn't working. Uh, and there's lots of products. There's new stuff out now that can definitely, definitely, definitely help that. But, you know, diet is a huge area. Diet's a massive area. It's it's fundamental to health uh, for us and our pets, but critically, absolutely. So you need to get that right. And from a from a essential oils perspective, when I was researching this, there was really only one oil that was coming up for all of these issues that we're talking about, which is our di digestive blend, which I spoke about last Friday uh, in my digestive support class. It's the same for pets. It's just that you're gonna change the dilution rate and you can possibly use a spray, but mostly gonna use it topically. So you're going to same, as I just mentioned before, we're gonna use our carrier oil. We're gonna make a little aromatic dressing so I think it's, um, let me just check the, uh, the drops. Make sure you get the right one this time. Yeah. <laughs> let me just check. I think it's uh, one to two drops in two tablespoons of oil or one tablespoon of oil. I just need to check that. Um, I've got like puppies, old dogs, little dogs. There's all different dilution rates, but I'll stick it up. But you don't need a lot. You're just going to use your carrier oil. You're going to use your digestion oil, which we know is so good for clearing... Um, you know, uh, anything that's going on in that track that feels a little bit a bit nasty and a bit funny. I, I used it last night, actually. Um, all I, I just have it in water, personally. But um, for pets, actually, for dogs, you can put a drop in water, but you're definitely not going to do that for cats. So make sure the cat can't access the water. That could go a little bit pear-shaped. But we're just rubbing it into the abdomen, guys. We're just using the carrier oil. We're using our Digest Zen. So Digest Zen, for people who don't know this oil, is anise, peppermint, ginger, caraway, coriander, tarragon, and fennel. This oil is amazing. I've used it so many times. I remember when we had a gastro bug when we all lived in Clunes and everyone got a, a glass of this and it works a treat. It just stops this, this nasty stuff in its tracks. I can't sit here and say it's going to cure my cat who's had ongoing... Um, inflammatory bowel issues going on I can't say it's going to cure your cat or dog but it's definitely a lovely support a lovely natural support that you can use daily you know to help support your your pet 
feel more comfortable and, and again less anxious you know when your pet's uncomfortable they're going to feel anxious if they just go hand in hand so this was really the only oil that came up for what we're talking about now um, it came up right across the board when I was looking at the spoil your pet book which has loads and loads of information it was written by a vet in terms of uh, what natural solutions to use for all of these things and this came up right across the board so keep that one handy guys for your dogs and cats when they've got any of the things going on that Steve just spoke about. Um, the last area that I want to talk about is just generalised infection, which could be anything from abscesses, mouth bacteria, ear infections, uh, even ticks. Um, it's kind of like a generalised area. So um, I might go through each of these and Steve can just give a really quick rundown on what... Well, I might, I might, I might step in here, Ange, because... Um... Angel is right. Uh, infection, whether it's bacterial, fungal, uh, viral, is a major issue for all of us. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with coronavirus globally right now. Um, one of the greatest sources of infection in us, but our pets particularly, is the mouth. And you would be staggered the number of times I'll open a, a mouth up in, in consultation and show the owners the rotting teeth and the enormous amount of dental disease that they were completely unaware of. And I'm sure you're all the same. It's probably pretty rare that you actually ever open your pet's mouth up and have a look at all the teeth all the way back, back and uh, top and uh, up and up and lower. Um, and you know, we see we see a heavy amount of dental disease. We see rotting teeth. We see abscesses. We see all sorts of things. So the problem with that is the, the gums are very very vascular, and um, most of the infections in the mouth are bacteria. So there are billions of bacteria sitting in that infection in the mouth. And that can, they can break off easily, get in the bloodstream, and then travel anywhere. So when we see urinary tract infections, when we see infections of the liver, when we see infections of the lung, of the heart, even worse, uh, generalised skin infections, things like that, frequently, frequently the source of those infections is the mouth. So dental hygiene is absolutely critical. A lot of that, again, comes back to diet. Uh, you know, a lot of people are happy to feed raw bones. There are dry foods that are designed specifically to clean the teeth. There's a lot of good owners out there that actually clean their pet's teeth. Um, there's good pastes and, and rinses and finger brushes and brushes and all sorts of things. But I cannot impress enough to take nothing else home away from this chat today. Look after your pet's teeth and mouth. It, it's absolutely fundamental. Thanks for that. Um, so I've got a couple of, it's really important actually, I'm glad you said that. So the, I've got a couple of things that came up that are quite common. Abscesses, Dad, what, how would you deal with an abscess from? Well, it depends on what the source of the abscess is. So we yeah. frequently see abscesses, I just mentioned from, from the teeth. So tooth root abscesses are quite common. People ring up and say, oh, my dog will catch a little lump under its eye. It's, it's usually, almost every time, a, an abscess of uh, one of the molar teeth, um, which will require extraction. Um, antibiotics are absolutely indicated in bacterial infections. Viral infections, antibiotics don't do anything. There's no real antiviral agents unless you know things get really bad. Um, well, we don't recommend using detergent, by the way, as, as the US president suggested. Uh, <laughs> but um, and fungal infections are very, very tricky and, and do require long, long courses. But in abscesses, yeah, we do see a lot of abscesses in cats due to cat fights. Um, you got to bear in mind, as I just described, mouths are usually pretty mucky, uh, and the canine teeth in, in cats and dogs are, are, are long teeth. So when they bite, they tend to create a deep puncture. The skin will heal over quite quickly because the wound isn't, isn't uh, the skin surface isn't uh, isn't wide, and then all those bugs just get trapped underneath the skin, and that's what causes you know cat or dog fight abscesses. Um, again, if your pet gets bitten, you know it's been bitten. Um, you know, using the oils and cleaning the area, if you have clippers, clipping the fur off so you can actually get to the skin and get to the wound is really, really important and may prevent an abscess forming and may prevent, therefore, a vet visit. But if you miss it and it turns into an abscess, you're almost certainly going to go and have to get that trained and get on to, to antibiotics if it's a bacterial cause, which they usually are. Yeah, well said. I've got a little recipe here for a healing salve, which I really love. So. Olive is a really good example. She got bitten by a dog on the weekend. She's got a puncture in her back. I'm keeping an eye on it. It's been cleansed. I'm using essential oils. If for some reason I feel like it's going to need something further, I'm going to take it to the professional. That healing salve is just coconut oil, lavender, myrrh, helichrysum. I can't tell you enough how amazing helichrysum is for healing. I've used it a 
a number of times on different issues on myself and equally just as good for our pets with some vitamin E and beeswax. Pop it in a jar. It's a nice little healing cell uh, just to help promote that healing, especially as Steve just said, if it's not as serious or we get it early, we can just use these natural solutions and just let it heal on its own with especially frankincense, copaiba. Steve was uh, attacked by a dog um, last year, I think. In it's a service on, station, not in the veterinary hospital. It's all on CCTV. This dog leapt out of a, a car window and attacked Steve and took a chunk out of his arm. It was a really, really impressive chunk as well. So um, I gave him a bottle of copaiba to pour into the wound and uh, he obviously took antibiotics as well. What, what else? Did you take anything else for it? No, that's better. Okay. So that was a mixture of using uh, pharma and essential oils. And I, you can't see the scar now, but like oh, I was so impressed. Well, it was a huge wound, it was huge. I was really impressed with that combo. Um, Copa Eva is one of the most incredible, incredible oils for healing uh, and using for infections. Um, I've used it myself so many times for different, um, for different things actually. Um, and there's loads of scientific papers on it. So. When we're talking about generalized infection, as Steve just said, you don't want to muck around with these things, but if you're in the early stages, you can certainly use the healing salve or just use your frankincense, your copaiba, or go a little go a little stronger with some oregano and some tea tree. But remember, oregano is a hot oil, so you're going to only need one drop and it has to be diluted. And you can't just go tipping oregano on pets because you're going to burn them just the same as we burn ourselves when we pour oregano on our skin. It's a really hot oil like clove and cinnamon and cassia, thyme. Uh, but it works a treat because it's our strongest antimicrobial in the whole of, do whole of doTERRA. So um, we use it to get rid of parasites. We use it for lots of different reasons. And we can use it with our pets, but you've got to research and make sure you've got you know, your dilution right before you do. Um, but oregano comes up, when I do research in terms of having open wounds, oregano always comes up as number one with copaiba and frankincense. So keep those ones handy, guys. And if you feel like you need to reach out and discuss this further, if you want to use it on your pets, uh, do so. Or if you feel like, you know what, we need to see the vet, we need to actually get onto this with some antibiotics, always advise that. Okay? Um, ear infections, Dad. Mm, ear infections are surprisingly common. You've probably all been with uh, ear infections in your dogs. One of the main reasons is we have very simple ear canals. We've just got a, a horizontal canal that goes in. If you go swimming, you get water in your ear, you can, you can shake it out and, uh, and get rid of it. Dogs and cats have a vertical canal, which does a 90 degree turn and then a horizontal canal, so it's an L shape. So if water gets in there from a swim or a bath, it tends to sit in there. And the big problem with that, particularly when it's warm and humid, is it creates a microenvironment in there that the bugs love. So it becomes quite alkaline it becomes warm and obviously it's moist and um, bacteria malassezia which is a type of yeast organism uh, have a field day we can get fungus infections in there so uh, ear infections are very common prevention is always better so you know um, if you are barking your pet trying not to get water down the ear if they go swimming and they get their head underwater you're going to have to use it to good ear uh, flush so there's things like epiotic and odo flush you can just buy over the counter at vets and pet stores um, and, and get shown how to use them properly. I'd use them regularly. But you know, often in spite of that, uh, or because of other circumstances, uh, we, do see, we do see a lot of ear infections. They're frequently associated with skin issues. So we talked about skin earlier, uh, whether it's through ATP or whether it's through food allergy. Um, you know, when the skin's irritated, and really, ears, as, a, as with us, are just an extension of skin. Um, when, when the skin gets irritated, the ears frequently get irritated. And, uh, you know, when dogs are scratching and itching, they frequently scratch with their back legs at their ears. They do a lot of head shaking if the ears are a problem. Um, and then, you know, you can end up with oral hematomas and things like that. We've got a, a dog in our circuit today, a big old dog that's having, having its ear operate on for that very reason. So the one bit of advice I will give, though, ears are very sensitive. At the bottom of that L shape, the bottom of our um, uh, horizontal canal sits an eardrum. Inside that is the middle ear and inside that is the inner ear. Now, if the eardrum ruptures and stuff gets in the middle ear, it can be really, really nasty. And you can end up with permanent balance issues. I've seen cats and dogs with, you know, things sort of called Horner syndrome where they've got a permanent head tilt and it never corrects. And the same thing happens in humans. So don't stick things down there without veterinary advice. Uh, Angel will repeat that with the oils. She's not suggesting that any oils go down ear canals, and I absolutely advocate that. 
and I'm saying don't stick anything down there unless you've seen a vet and you know it's safe or they, they prescribe something for you. They're very sensitive and as I said, if you cause balance issues or you cause deafness through uh, burst eardrums, that generally doesn't reverse. So be very, very careful. They're very common, uh, but always, always handle them properly. And from a essential oil perspective, I've got a little uh, a little salve here, geranium lavender. Frankie, just on the back of the ears, you never put it on the inside of the ears and never in the oils, uh, in the ears, as Steve just mentioned. Never, never, never. It's just, it's going to end badly. We don't put anything in anyone's ears. So just rub down the back. It's nice little support. Geranium. Geranium is so good for any inflammation as a rule. It's one of the best oils. I only need one drop. Lavender. And what am I missing? Frankie, boy. Frankie, Frankie. Okay, so you can make a little salve with some carrier oil. Uh, just keep it really, really simple, guys. Um, and that's it's just a nice little support. And as Steve just said, we don't want to be leaving these things too late either. Otherwise, you end up with permanent, you know, hearing damage. Uh, ticks, Stevie. What do we need to say about ticks? Well, because ticks are really prevalent uh, in parts of Australia. We have lots of them up here. Luckily, cross fingers, none of ours have had one yet. What well, again, like again, prevention is always better than cure. So there's a there's a number of tick species. Most of them don't cause major problems. So scrub ticks and cattle ticks and things like that on our domestic pets don't cause major health issues. But we do have the paralysis tick on the east coast of Australia, um, and you know it frequently kills dogs and cats, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, there's a lot of good preventative products that your vets can advise you on, uh, whether they're you know internal internally taken or spot on applications. There's some very very effective stuff. Uh, the one bit of advice I'll give: if you do find a tick on your pet, uh, never ever ever put a product on it that will kill the tick while it's on your pet, because it will kill it. And I've had plenty of instances where people put metho or whatever on; it will kill the tick. And in dying, the tick will ingest all of its toxin into the pet. And then all the clinical signs will manifest after that. So the advice I'll give you is, you know, speak, speak to your vet about these little professional tick removers. You can buy the cheap, uh, very fine tick forceps are ideal to pluck the tick from the mouth parts where it's uh, attached to the skin up and away. And then, you know, there's a, there will generally be what we call a tick crater. So where the ticks burrowed into the, the skin, its mouth parts have gone in uh, where it's attached. Uh, there's often a crater there. And, you know, there's certainly always you could put onto the crater but don't ever put oils or anything on, on the tickets on your pet. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think the main oils that they talk about are lavender and peppermint. Everywhere I look when I'm looking for information is mostly lavender because lavender is one of the best oils for skin for so many reasons. And peppermint comes up quite a lot with ticks as well. Um, so either of those is really, really handy. Um, I th is there any, any other generalised infections that's worth mentioning? Or that's well, I think we covered a lot of ground there. Okay, great. Ground. So when it comes, I just want to chat quickly about uh, safety and dilution. Um, with cats, as I mentioned before, we need to be really, really careful. They have, uh, is it a liver enzyme that they're missing yep. that creates issues yep. when we're using essential oils? So with my boy, he's 16, I've always made sure over the last four years that he can escape. If I have a diffuser on, he can actually leave the room and go somewhere where there is no diffuser, so either to another room or outside. I never enclose rooms and shut everything off, which might be a bit hard if you're living in an apartment or a really small house. But I think if you're diffusing, you've got to remember the power of the plant. So I keep all my windows open, I keep all my doors open um, and make sure my animals can escape. And I usually know, because if I put something on in my bedroom, which is different to what I would normally do, maybe a wintergreen, for example, the animals just clear out. They, they just clear out straight away. And that's how I always know if I'm using something that is possibly irritating them. But particularly cats, so you've got to be really good with your dilution in your diffuser. So I spoke to someone the other day who put 20 drops in their diffuser and I almost had a heart attack and she said, um, you know, my throat's hurting. And I'm like, I'm not surprised because you poured half the bottle in there. So guys, we've got to get really good with learning how to use these oils. We need to be safe with them. You know, we need to be uh, we need to be respectful, actually. So with cats, as I mentioned before, you've got to be really careful with tea tree, birch, wintergreen, spearmint, peppermint, and the hot oils, oregano, thyme, cassia, cinnamon. When I mentioned before about infections using oregano, you can use oregano with some of those, you know, you know, infections on the skin. You're definitely never going to put oregano inside a cat or a dog. But if you're using it topically, make sure you get the dilution right with the carrier oil because we know the benefits of oregano. 
but particularly with cats just be really really careful and kind of err on the side of not of saying don't use it and going with something safer like frankincense or copaiba which are equally just as good when we're applying oils one of the great ways to do it is just put one or two drops into the palms of our hands and rub the fur like pet, pat your cat or pat your dog and the, they will get the benefits of that oil through the aroma and just through osmosis like we don't need to pull the fur apart and pour the oil on we just we just don't work like that so this morning when I got Barbara up my cat he just got a nice rub down with frankincense all over and off he went it's really really therapeutic and we know how good it is for us and we know how good it is for our pets as well um, you can also pop a couple of drops into the litter tray of the cat if the cat has a litter tray which most cats should because we don't want cats outside at night um, I hate litter as a rule but I've had it for 16 years now because I hate cats outside they kill wildlife it's something that Steve and I feel very passionate about so we have to use litter and so you can put it you know if your cat's got um, you know inflammatory issue you can put some digest sand in the litter tray if they've got anxiety uh, or, or skin conditions you can put some of those oils into the litter tray and they still get the benefits of it but just don't pour it all in just a couple of drops is great um, more frequent doses so of a spray or topical application are better than like one heavy big application so probably two to three a day once a day if you need to but certainly don't do once every couple of days and just pour a whole lot on that's that's not going to be good for your pet um, good places to apply the abdomen paws uh, spine they're all really good places definitely not the ears as we said and definitely not near the eyes never 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 it's we don't I, I really struggle with some of these oils near my eyes my eyes just water to death so we don't want them near the near the eyes of the pets um, internally as I mentioned before when we're wanting to you know you can actually use on guard and digest zen uh, on your dogs you can put a drop in the water don't use it on cats but you can put a drop in the water of both of those ddr prime as well this is such a great cellular blend that we can also use on our pets i just put it on you know with some uh, carrier oil topically i use the supplements of ddr prime but this is just the oil the oil blend on its own equally amazing just for general over overall health I've seen so many amazing stories on how to use DDR Prime in humans and um, and I'm sure there's lots for the pets as well. Um, I know it's a, it's an amazing blend. It's, uh, what are we? Let me have a look. Uh, for some reason I can't read it. Frankincense as we mentioned, wild orange, litzy, thyme, clove, lemongrass, all powerhouse oils. So feel free to play, play around with that one as well. I haven't mentioned it in some of these recipes, but it's also, it's also a good one to have handy. Um, always make sure you're using therapeutic grade oils. Now we are talking about doTERRA. So of course they're therapeutic. They've just been through the TGA process, which is so exciting. I've been waiting for that for four years for them to be stamped TGA approved, which means therapeutic grade. This is really, really important, guys, because we don't want to be buying oils from the supermarket or the health food store or the chemist that say it's pure, that says it's organic, it says it's, you know, the bells and whistles, and it's not. It's full of synthetics. So that's when you're actually putting your pets at risk uh, and harm when you're diffusing things that are full of synthetics. Now, these don't have synthetics in them. They're pure. They have a number on the bottom that you can check in the source to you website which gives us a full report of exactly what's in that bottle. Full chemical breakdown, chemical component breakdown, chemical constituent breakdown. Um, so this is really, really important, guys. If you're going to use essential oils, well, for yourself, they need to be therapeutic and also for your pets. We've got to look after everyone in the house. So doTERRA is TGA approved. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Peppermint was the first oil to be approved. I saw the paperwork and I'm very excited. doTERRA went through a very long process to get us to this space. And it just means that we can talk more about these oils therapeutically than we can before. These, they take these things very, very seriously because there's so many products out there on the market that people say can do this and this and this and they don't. And sometimes people, you know, fall foul of it. So we've got to be really careful with what we say and how we use them. Um, I think that's actually about it. What I'll do, guys, is I'll switch my recipes up. Um, oh, yeah. I'll stick the recipes up after this. Uh, what are we on? 54 minutes. I'll stick the recipes up that I've spoken about so you guys can uh, have a play with those. Uh, I'll put a link up to where you can get these little bottles. These bottles are awesome. They're so handy. You can chuck them in your handbag. Obviously, you know where to get the oils. If you're new and you're not sure, just reach out. Um, I'm just going to jump...
can see there are any from anyone. Um, I've been yapping and I haven't even thought. Did you want to say anything else, Steve, before I just take these questions? No. Warts. Do animals get warts? Yep. They do? Oregano? Yep. Oh, yeah, I'd always go for oregano. But again, you've got to be so careful, guys. You don't just tip oregano on. It's got to be like one drop diluted to a certain, like two tablespoons of carrier oil at a minimum. Um, Mel said Jack, Jack Russell with a dry eye. What do we do for dry eyes? Mm. I have no idea. Well, you wouldn't be using oils in a dry eye. There's, um, there's a, we tend to use a product called Cyclosporin, which is an immunosuppressant. If it's genuine, what we call Corella conjunctivitis sicca, which is dry eye. Um, yes, so daily, daily cyclosporine in the eye. It's uh, very safe and very easy to apply. And uh, keep it under control. Awesome. We actually have an eye cream here in this house that gets used on everyone. <laughs> in fact, we have a lot of products in my fridge that get used on everyone, whether you're an animal or a human. They're all veterinary products too. Yeah. <laughs> When I had that terrible viral laryngitis last year, when I actually thought I was dying, Steve gave me the cat's cortisone. I was so, so sick. I was like, you know, what's this going to do? And Steve's like, I don't actually know. We had the biggest laugh about it. She, um, got, she got her voice back, I got my voice back. Um, Mel says, how many drops of each for the anxiety spray? Babe, I'm going to put the recipes up. So 20 drops of lavender, 10 of cedarwood, 5 of vetiver, 5 of frankincense. I'm going to put it up so everyone can see this and jump on in. We've done really well. I thought I'd sit at around 45 minutes, but we're at 56. Um, again, like the hormonal support class, there is so many parts to talking about hormones and hormonal support and essential oils that you could do 500 classes and not cover everything because the human body is just an insane beast. We have so many ways you could go with this. Again, same with the vet stuff, same with the pet stuff. Like there's so many different areas we can go in, but we just picked the most common that Steve comes across and the most common things that we can actually help support at home with our essential oils. I mean, we're buying the oils for ourselves and we need to be using them with our pets as well, just as a support system, you know, just to help keep them calm uh, and for the things that we've just mentioned, you know, skin, um, dietary intolerances, um, digestive issues, just generalized infection. We've gone through quite a lot today. So I hope that's been really, really helpful. If there's any other questions, just shoot them through afterwards. And um, if anyone wants to purchase anything from today, I'll put the links in. But again, just send me a message. I'm a message girl, so just shoot me a message and I'll help you get started. If you come through today with an order of 100 PV as a new person, so it's around $100, doTERRA is also going to send you a free Citrus Bliss and a free Tangerine, which is super, super yummy and super cool. Um, we've only got a couple more days of this month of Diamond Club until we head into next month, which is our final month. Um, I hope this has been really helpful, guys, right across the board. This is our first pet class. I think Steve did a really, really good job, um, super job actually, with explaining um, the science and the practicality around a lot of these issues. You know what I'm like, I'm like just chuck an oil on it. So that was really, really helpful. I loved all of it actually. And um, yeah, we'll probably jump in soon with uh, with our next instalment of how to use essential oils with our pets. So on that note, I'm going to love and leave you guys. I hope it's been really, really helpful. Steve's peace doing out, peace out. <laughs> We've lost Joe. God knows where he is. He's probably up to absolutely no good. Um, and we're going to see you guys soon. Lots of love. Bye.